And joining us now on the line from Vancouver, British Columbia, Jerry Sinclair. She is special advisor on digital media and a visiting professor at Ryerson University. And we're happy to have you on the line from the left coast, Jerry. I guess I should start by asking you, last I saw, Ryerson was in Toronto. What are you doing out in Vancouver? Well, Steve, I've had a very long and checkered career. I started out uh, doing work online, um, oh, maybe 25 years ago. And uh, in today's age of the internet with Skype and email and um, all kinds of social media, um, travel is, uh, is not really a, a real problem. So I, I spend about a week every month in, in Toronto at Ryerson, but uh, the rest of the time I'm online. Well, since you've raised that checkered career, let me take you actually back further to uh, your days as a I mean, you've got a PhD in Renaissance drama, if I'm not mistaken. You made the transition from teaching Shakespeare uh, to the tech world. That's not a normal transition from what I understand. Why don't you tell us a bit about how that happened? Well, I've been trying to figure it out myself for, <laughs> for most of my life. But I think uh, probably the best way to explain it is I've always been interested in, in many, many things. And uh, I started off in the academic world. I, I did a, a doctorate, as you know, in Renaissance drama and um, then moved into the business world because I was always passionate about, about business. As a kid, I had uh, you know, lemonade stands and, and um, I had little, little games that I set up in the, in the schoolyard. I was always interested in, in the business world, so I spun out some technology from, from my lab at Simon Fraser University and, and with two very young men in their 20s started up a, uh, an internet software company. And then from there, after I sold that company to Microsoft in 2001, I, um, I joined Microsoft and was a, was a senior executive, a country manager for MSN uh, for Canada for a couple of years. And then I left Microsoft and started up a brand new career as a government policy advisor, uh, advising both the, the BC government, uh, Gordon Campbell, uh, right after he got elected, I was his first um, president of his technology council, advising him on, on strategy for the province. And then in uh, 2000 and uh, what were the years of four and five, five, I headed up the telecom policy review for the federal government. And the interesting thing for me is that when, when I was in the academic world, I loved being there, but I, I kind of yearned for the, the focus and the practical results driven ability of the business world. And when I was in the business world, I, I yearned for the, the freedom, the intellectual freedom, uh, and the fact that you didn't have to focus on customers and employees, uh, that kind of freedom and exploration and, and um, you know, curiosity-driven research that I enjoyed in the academic world. And when I was in the world of government, um, I yearned for both of the other worlds. So, <laughs> so I guess you could say that I've, I've um, maybe I, I suffer from attention deficit, I'm not sure. Or you've hit the home run with this last gig because it seems to combine a lot of those different interests. And let me follow up with that because you were brought to Ryerson, I gather, in part to develop the Digital Media Zone, which was launched back in April. Tell us, what does that do? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to be at Ryerson because as, as you really put your finger on it, it does bring together all three of the aspects of my, my, uh, my previous career. And digital media is, um, is an area I s I've spent about the last four years exploring. I set up a, a brand new program in 2007 at uh, Great Northern Way Campus in Vancouver. It was a partnership of the four largest universities in, in Vancouver to create a, a, a master's degree in digital media. And um, you know, a number of a number of universities are getting very interested in digital media. Digital media really under underlies almost every industry there is right now because um, it's a convergence of, of uh, text and and graphics and and, um, and video, but it has a base in technology. So it's really a transdisciplinary um, discipline in in a sense. And Ryerson has been has been very interested in setting up um, the digital media zone, and they they invited me to come out and and help them out with this. Um, with this new endeavor, and I, I, I was really excited the very first time I entered the digital media zone, because um, you know, first of all, it is multidisciplinary in, in the true sense. Uh, it, you know, transmedia. There, there are students there from computer science. There are students there from business. There are students there from from graphics. There are students there from game design. So it's very interdisciplinary, very collaborative in that sense. But I guess what's most exciting is that um, it's really focused on student entrepreneurship. And I don't think I've seen another place that is that is really that focused on young, uh, bright ideas. And and Ryerson came up with this notion that. Entrepreneurship generally um, uh, lives within the, the 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 bellies and the souls of young students. And uh, you know, when you when you when you think about it, uh, and I like to ask this question: What what does Steve Jobs, uh, Bill 
Gates, Mike Lazaridis, and Mark Zuckerberg all have in common. They're all millionaires today, or billionaires. Billionaires, billionaires, yeah, yeah they set up billion dollar companies, but they all um, didn't complete university. And they set up these billion, billion um, dollar companies with their, with their friends that they met at university. And, and it was, it's been my experience too, when, when I was in the academic world, that, that young people have the you know have the drive to create to create not only to create ideas but to but to take them out into the marketplace or to apply them uh, for social benefit or okay Jerry so let me impact. follow up on that then if you're if you're a young person with a good idea and you want to be part of this digital media zone how do you go about making that happen uh, well if you're a Ryerson student or an alumnus or an alumna <laughs> um, you can you basically need to put together a business plan and Ryerson has um, has a, a capability in their business school in their entrepreneurship um, uh, department to help you get that business plan together you need to have um, a team and then you you get a chance to pitch before a steering committee about um, uh, uh, your company your your idea for a product or a service and if you get in then you're allowed to um, to enter the zone the digital media zone uh, where you get access to um, not only to free space and equipment, but what's really exciting is, is um, you get access to mentorship and to other teams who are working on, um, on also new ideas. So you get access to the entrepreneurial spirit, but there are um, venture capitalists who are coming in. There are, there are people from industry coming in. The, the whole place is, is um, you know, buzzing with activity and, uh, and innovation. But I presume you've got to buy your way in, do you not? Nope, you, no, it's completely free. There, oh. you, you don't pay anything, and uh, you know, Ryerson University supports your, your, um, your time in the zone. Uh, and what's really remarkable to me, it's only been open for seven months, and during that seven months, 14 new companies have been formed, and also three of them have graduated. They, they've, uh, they've added so many new people that there's no room for them anymore in the zone, so they've moved out to, uh, to Toronto, outside of the zone. So three have already graduated in seven months. So, so this is really um, you know, a, a commercialization um, generator in a, in a very profound way. And, and when, when it was originally envisaged, how much time did you anticipate each person being in this zone? Well, I, I think, um, you know, I wasn't there when it, when it first kicked off, but I think uh, it took everybody by surprise because these are students, uh, and these are, these are students who are, who are still working on their studies. But the zone is open 24-7, um, and you can find students there all the time, and, and it's, it's really exciting how much time they really are putting into it. Now, I'm not sure how much you know about University of Waterloo's incubator, that so-called accelerator center, but does this differ from that? Well, I think I think that that the Ryerson uh, zone differs from from most other incubation centers in Canada because it combines in a very unique way two different kinds of um, of research. One is student-driven entrepreneurship, and I've just talked about that. The other is market-driven research. So, so the other um, the other aspect of the zone is companies come to the zone um, looking to have access to leading-edge innovation ideas from from students and faculty, and the zone matches these companies with teams of students who can actually um, drive this idea into the marketplace. So, so it really is a, you know, bo although all incubation centers um, are, are very much commercialization drivers, I think that, that Ryerson has got a really unique and exciting model, and I'm really happy to be part of it. Okay. Now, you did tell us earlier that you worked for Gordon Campbell, the, the soon-to-be former Premier of British Columbia, yeah. uh, doing some advice, um, advising of him. I think you also did a federal review panel as well where you were providing advice on this. So tell us this, That's how right. do you see the role of government in funding the research that can lead to innovation? Well, I, I think um, it, it's very important for, for government to continue to fund pure research. Um, there, there's no question about it. it it's, uh, it's vital to, you know, to the future of Canada and to the future of the world. But I think there's another part of, um, of research, and I've talked about it as market-driven research. Sometimes it's, it's uh, described as innovation, and innovation is distinguished from invention, which is more like curiosity-driven research. And innovation really um, takes invention and actually Realizes it, or, um, or or brings it into the marketplace or into society where it can have real real impact. And I can give you an example from my my own past. When I was at Simon Fraser University, um, 
my team developed some technology uh, that was was pure invention in a sense because uh, what that technology did is it it was in the, the heyday of the internet very early on and Netscape had just gone public and um, so the, there was a browser but there was no way at that particular point to actually transmit um, packages of code so that actual computer programs or little applets could run vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the web. So my group um, wrote a specification uh, to allow objects to be embedded within browsers and uh, we released it on the internet thinking, oh boy, um, this is going to be great because the world is going to see how smart we are and we're going to get a lot of reputation to our lab and, and um, it'll be really great. You know, we were looking for, for, you know, for, for reputation more than anything. And uh, within the, the first couple of days, it was downloaded 10,000 times, which was really something in 1995. And at that point, we had a number of companies who, were, who then said they wanted to acquire us. And we had a number of venture capitalists who said, give us a business plan. We want to invest in you. This all so sounds we, good. Why do I think there's a but coming? <laughs> no, there's no but. Oh, we okay. stumbled. We stumbled into into innovation because we had no intention at the beginning to commercialize our you know our technology. But because there was so much interest in it, um, we then set about uh, to create a company, and then figure out how to how to really um, create a business that was going to provide value to our shareholders. Okay, and we it's had a interesting. Number of investors at that point. I want to pick up on that word you said. We stumbled into it, and I'm going to talk about the Ontario talk with the Ontario Minister of Innovation about this later in the program, but, but I, I have had people tell me in the past that the best innovation takes place, if you like, you know, in somebody's garage. You work at it, you work at it, you stumble into it, and, and you know, then it either kicks off and it takes off, rather, or it doesn't. I gather the rage, though, in more formal circles is to set things up either in a university setting or, you know, at Mars, for example, in Toronto. And I, you know, some people have told me that that's not the best setting to have the innovation that we need actually take place. It's too structured. It's too formal. We need it to be more in people's garages or in people's basements. Have you got a view on that? Yeah, I actually have a, have a lot to say about that. It seems to me innovation, um, again, unlike invention, which, which is focused on you know, a single process, a single product, a single idea more, more often than not, innovation um, comes about as a result of a combination of a number of ideas or processes um, or even products. So if you think about uh, the, the iPod, for instance, there were MP3 players around before the iPod. Uh, what iPod did is it, it brought together an, uh, an elegance of design Design, ease of use, ergonomics, an MP3 player, plus iTunes and the right pricing model for, for music. And all of that together was a huge innovation in, in the marketplace. And so from my perspective, um, it doesn't really matter where, you know, where innovation takes place as long as there's great access to a, a range of ideas and attitudes and diversity. So it can take place in a garage where you're not constrained. It can take place in, in, a, in a university incubator as long as there are, there are no side Silos. I think silos are the are the enemy of innovation, and we want to be, um, you know, from my perspective, innovation takes place around the edges, uh, and you want freedom of um, of transmission and distribution of ideas and product ideas and concepts at those edges, and that's that's really um, what the what the zone is attempting to do. Yeah, that's why it's it's so important that it's transdisciplinary. Uh, it brings together people across the disciplines in the university. No, I get that, Jerry, but and let me just we're down our last few minutes, and I want to make sure I get this in here. You know, government okay. works in silos. You know, all of the money is doled out in different silos, and you say that that's an anathema to making good innovation take place. So how do you get around that? Well, I think I think government is uh, is um, actually moving forward in this. I, I'm on the board of a of a national center for excellence that was funded by both by NSERC, which is which is the um, the the national um, science uh, funding council, and uh, SHRC, the Social Sciences and Huma Humanities Research Council. This is the first time that a cross disciplinary um, uh, national center of excellence has ever been funded. Uh, when you look at at what the Ontario um, government is doing with the FedDev. Uh, investments right now. A lot of those are co go across disciplines, and I think there's a, there's a growing um, realization that we have to get beyond the silos in order for innovation to happen in Canada and for us to become productive again. Okay. In our last minute here, let me ask you this: When we tend to think innovation, we tend to think, of course, of the economic, the productivity benefits that we can glean from innovation. I'm wondering what the possible social benefits are from making the changes that you're outlining. 
Oh, I think they're huge. Um, they're, they're extraordinary. If you, if you look at Facebook, for instance, um, which, which actually has um, close to 50% of all Canadians, not just internet Canadians, um, on board, Facebook's second uh, most popular application is Causes, where you can actually um, invest in your favorite cause through a social network. And, and this whole area of social innovation is becoming extraordinarily important. And um, I, I, you know, I, I'm really pleased about uh, the, the, um, the extra extraordinary opportunity we all have before us to have a, a social impact through these technologies. Hmm. Jerry Sinclair, it's awfully good of you to join us on the line from Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I, I guess, should I ask you who you think our next billionaire is going to be coming out of Ryerson University? You want to give us a hint on that? <laughs> no, but, but uh, there, there are at least four or five really promising companies in there right now. You should come by and see. That's a deal. When they hit the pay dirt, you let us know, okay? Okay, you got it. Good to talk to you. Jerry Sinclair, the special advisor on digital media and a visiting professor at Ryerson University. We reached her on the line in Vancouver, B.C.